Okay. So welcome everybody. And uh, we hope that uh, many people on YouTube are enjoying themselves. And uh, so we're just getting our screen set up here. Okay. So tonight we're going to continue our talk of uh, with the two women liberation on Bodhicitta. But before we do that, uh, as we do the, um, the opening prayers, uh, we're going to take a little bit more time with the opening prayers with the Tibetan pronunciation. So if there's any questions that anybody has, uh, I think maybe the best way to proceed with this is to... Um, well, what is the best way to proceed with this? Should we, uh, should I just read, uh, recite the prayers and then um, and stop at any time anybody has a question or some, or would somebody like to res, uh, lead, be leading the opening prayers? And then when you get stuck on something, then we can talk about it. What do you think, Zara? Um, well, I mean, you, you can, I can ask all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I, you know me, I'm a talker, Lance. So, you know, you just tell me what you want. I can, my preference is more of a didactic instruction um, How and then moving into the contextual stuff. However, um, you want to just all give right, it a well, go. Let's do it this it? way. All right, so let's do it this way. Let's um, start with the altruistic motivation. I'll do the recitation and then we'll go back over the Tibetan and uh, take it one line at a time, one word at a time. So if there's any questions, we can talk about it. Is that okay? Let's try it that way. Yeah. See how that works. Hi, Mark. Another thing, hey, Mark, another thing I was thinking is, Hi, uh, everybody. I even want to do it this way is even, just, and also maybe even just saying a little bit of like what the prayer means, like means to us or like what meaning we take from it when we're reciting these prayers. That's something I've been trying to think more about a little bit recently too is another idea or we could come back to that another time of course as well well no let's let's do that tonight and i think that's important and uh this is part of bodhicitta you know having compassion and being able to uh do what we can so everybody can recite the prayers understand the meaning of the prayers and so on so uh so i think it's a good thing to do right now listen everybody i'm sorry to be late i apologize but tell me where we are right now on and we're doing the the uh the king of aspiration prayers right uh not tonight no we're uh, not that was that was yesterday i know yesterday i thought we were going to finish it tonight no no that'll be next week where are we tonight tonight we're starting with the opening prayers and we're going to do a little bit of a um um embellishment on the meaning understanding the meaning of the uh, prayers and the uh and the tibetan recitation how to pronounce okay. which, the words. which one are we starting with please we'll start with the altruistic motivation oh, okay so i'm not that late okay no okay thank you did you bring the pizza <laughs> <laughs> that's very funny <laughs> and i haven't eaten since noon a uh, pizza would be great. All right. Okay, so we begin with the opening prayers, the altruistic motivation. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. So I want to welcome Alex. How are you to this evening? Okay, so let's look at the meaning of this. So all mothers sentient beings, so we regard all sentient beings as our mother. And this is what helps us to develop our loving kindness and our compassion. As we would do for our mother, we will do for all other beings. So this is something that we have to um, be mindful of, that even those beings who mean us harm, 
So as it says, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. So even those beings, especially those beings, we are focusing, being mindful of those beings, and we want to have loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. In other words, bodhicitta for these beings and so on. So it's easy for us to do for our family. It's easy to, for us to do it for our friends, but it's most difficult to do it with strangers, people that we don't know, and especially those who we know that, you know, would mean us harm or our close ones harm. So uh, we need to have that degree of forgiveness, that degree of understanding, that degree of compassion for them. This is why it's the altruistic motivation. Altruism means, you know, with brotherly, sisterly love for other beings, to care for other beings and so on. So this is our prime motivation. So then the third line in the prayer says, may they experience happiness, be separated from suffering. So we want them to be uh, have happiness. We want them to be separated from suffering. They are suffering. They have some degree of unhappiness, sorrow, confusion, by because they're coming to us with um, bad intentions. They're trying to do us harm by the definition here in the in the second line. So we're trying to look through that and not con conflict with that, their bad intentions. We're trying to look from, through that to see that their causes uh, are what they need to recognize, what they need to understand and so on. So we're, we're doing this practice, we're saying these prayers for the benefit of others. So this is a case in point of doing that. And then the last line here says, swiftly, I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. So to whatever power I have, to whatever degree I have, even if I imagine that they are Buddha, that they are enlightened, I will do that in order to be able to have a, um, a loving kindness for them, a compassion for them. So I imagine them as being holy beings and place them on the crown of my head, as it says in the 37 practices of the Bodhisattva, that those who, who mean us harm and so on, I'll put on the crown of my head. So that's generally the, the meaning line by line. Uh, Bernie, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Or does anybody have any uh, questions or comments about this? Bernie, your microphone's muted. Muted. Uh, you did a pretty good job. Uh, let's see, what could I add? Uh, well, we could explain why Buddhahood is complete or something like that, but that nothing more to be attained. It's the completion of all good qualities, perfect and unsurpassed. These are traditional adjectives that define, that they use for Buddhahood, but uh, uh, I really can't add anything else, so. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions or like to uh, discuss this? I want this to be happening because it, it, it it's all, forgive me for saying so, but it's too simple. And, and that we're taking it apart, I think is very wonderful and it's important to me if to no one else. Well, good. Okay. And that's that's important. That's why we're doing this. Yes. We're all beginners. We look at this that we're all beginners. You know, so we've all been through this. We're all learning this. So it's for all of us that we do this. Yes. So happy we're doing this. Okay. So um, let's recite this now together one time in English everybody in English again. So we recite, all mothers sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, hate me. obstructors who harm me, hate and me. those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. 
may they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. So I think as we recite this, it should be done from the heart. That as you're saying these words, as you're saying these phrases and these lines, that it's your heart that is sending out light, loving kindness, wisdom, and compassion to all these beings. And thinking in your mind, who are the most difficult beings on this planet that I would want to be able to send this, this prayer to and think about them and, and do it from your heart center. So uh, for myself, as, as first I learned these prayers, I memorized these prayers, and then I started really understanding the meaning of them. And I recite them during the day, I recite them at night, and so on. So in, in order to keep them fresh in my mind and keep my, keep my motivation pure and strong. Can so I say something? Certainly. I, I have a situation where I was swindled of many thousands of dollars. And I, 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 every time I read this, the opening prayer, I, I, I concentrate on obstructors who harm me, those who create obstacles in my path of liberation and omniscience. May I experience happiness be separated from suffering and swiftly I'll establish them, these cheats and liars, in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. And it, it, it is supremely difficult for me. And and I'm not alone, and I know that. But I have been wronged deeply. And to be to be a Buddhist, I need to adopt this prayer. And it's extremely difficult for me. Well, there lies the practice. That's why we do the practice. That we practice being forgiving. We practice loving kindness. We practice bodhicitta, at least for these few minutes that we're doing these prayers. And more and more as we do that, more and more, more and more, our ego, more and more our attachments and our aversions begin to melt away. Hey, Mark, something like that happened to me as well. Um, and I, Lance is already aware of this. I was swindled out of 350,000 US dollars in a cyber scam. And um, I was actually in a very low moment, wasn't, it wasn't well, but I went back to these teachings, what Lance is saying and was like, this is great. My karma is cleansing. Um, and I went back to compassion for the people that, like you said, like the people that we wronged actually was like, oh, maybe they're start like I just had compassion. Like I actually went to compassion as that, like that thought stream and was like, this is great. Um, so I, I see that your situation as a positive, although that may not comfort you immediately. For me, it's the beginning of the like, beginning of a positive strand. It means something you you know done energetically has been cleared. Now you can move forward. Your microphone is muted, Mike. Mark, your microphone is muted. He's saying really good stuff right now. I'm sure. Like profound. Yeah. Okay. There can you, you are. Now? There you are. You were, you were replying to Zara. Hold on. There we are. Can you hear me now? Yes. Zara, thank you. I, I'm happy you shared that with me. And, or with all of us, for that matter. And this, the altruistic motiv motivation is monstrously difficult for me right now. And yet I know, number one, I know I have no choice. And number two, I will grow by, by adopting this, this pledge to establish them in a state of perfect, unsurpassed, 
complete and precious Buddhahood. And because if I do that, as we say in all of, of our Buddhist practices, we, we meditate for ourselves, but we also meditate for the benefit of all sentient beings. And if I can, if I can wish compassion and improvement in their karma, then I've succeeded. That's that's how I treat this. Well, good. Yes, uh, and and thank you both for bringing up the point of karma, because uh, sometimes when we do the when we are receiving this negativity. It's our karma. It's the causes of our karma that maybe we need to have this come up because maybe in a prior lifetime or maybe when we were, you know, 16 years old and did something to somebody and created this karma for us. Now we're getting, you know, something is coming towards us that, you know, we need to experience ourselves. Maybe we did this to somebody else, in other words, and now this is being done to us. Yeah. Maybe you know, I um I know people who are very suspicious people, and every time something happens to them or to somebody else, they're always thinking about other people that are doing these these things and everything. And I I would say to them, I say, what did you do in a past lifetime that makes <laughs> you think about these things all the time? <laughs> yes, you know. Yeah. These things don't enter many people's minds. People who's on the path, oh, was, these things don't enter a Bodhisattva's mind. But someone who's thinking about these things obviously is impure and needs to work on that. I agree completely. It makes thank you for saying that. Yes. Matt, you were going to say something? It just, I was going to, and I'm not saying this is this. I'm not comparing this necessarily to to your two situation, but it was making me think the prayer of um, mm -hmm. uh, a documentary a long, long time ago about Ram Dass, and he would put a he put George W. Bush a picture of George W. Bush <laughs> on, on his uh, on his altar, like next to the pictures of his guru and everything, and he had it up there. Apparently, he had as we can all imagine, I'm sure, problems with uh, George W. Bush, and uh, it's just funny. It made me think of that with this thing. Yeah, we, we learn more from the people that are difficult in our lives than we do the people that are easy in our lives. Oh, that's true. So we, we have to have gratitude for those people and think of those people as our greater teachers. If I could say something, this question has come up several times in uh, classes, and uh, the answer I remember is that uh, it's when you think of terrible people and how can you possibly have compassion for them? You know, there's so many terrible things in the world. Keith. Uh, let's not just go into them, but uh, uh, that everybody is the same and that they're suffering from the delusion of egotism. The idea that they get some real and permanent benefit from doing the things that they do. Whereas in reality, their egotism is their principal cause of suffering. Uh -huh. And because everyone suffers equally from this kind of egotism, it's possible to feel compassion for, for everybody equally. Because unless you're enlightened, you've got this very difficult problem, which is going to cause you suffering from... Uh, whenever you're born until the day that you die. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for the, all your comments. So let's look at the uh, Tibetan now. And let me remind everybody that the reason why we do the Tibetan, there's two important reasons why we do the Tibetan. The first is, maybe the most important is that the Buddha taught in Sanskrit 2,600 years ago. And it was just a 
oral oral language it didn't have it didn't have a, a, an alphabet it couldn't be written down at the time that he was teaching but yet it was the language that was being taught and that language then you know kind of morphed into other languages in that you know uh in this region that india region the um the uh himalayan region and so on so uh, uh the pali language came out of that the um the uh hindu language came out of that probably many others and not the least of which here uh the tibetan language came out of the the sanskrit so as we are reciting this in the sanskrit or as in the tibetan <clears throat> based on the, on the sanskrit we are we are harmonizing again with that vibration that has been added to over and over and over again through the many generations through the many eons of time that's been added to and so on and we are vibrating with that same vibration as the buddha was vibrating giving these teachings and so on so there is this visceral uh connection that we're making with the tibetan language even without knowing what all the different words mean we can feel the vibration of them and as there's melodies and even if we don't use a melody but we're just chanting in a monotone there's a vibration to that so there's that element of of harmonizing along with all the masters with the buddha and so on presently there's thousands and thousands of people if not more millions of people who are who are uh, reciting these kinds of prayers and practices right now all around the world so we're making a connection point with them right now and then the, those in the future and so on the second reason is that our teachers our tibetan teachers have learned our language to some degree and are taking great lengths to be able to provide these teachings for us and even if they're talking through a translator they are having to organize their thoughts and everything to be able to do this through their language so we're meeting them halfway they're meeting us with their compassion to be able to bring all this and they're learning our language and so on and we're showing them respect by by learning a little bit of their language so that we can at least recite these prayers in their language so it's written out phonetically for us here so it's easier for us to be able to uh to do this but um uh, but those are the two reasons it's the compassion of the master that we are trying to honor and be grateful for and it's because of the vibration that was set up by the uh <clears throat> by the buddha and continued by all the great masters that continue to say these prayers so to go through this prayer in the tibetan we see that some of these words have a hyphen like dagla dag la it's two words dagla so it's they're pronounced together dagla so then dagla dang war jpe dra and then you see a, a forward slash which is kind of like a um a, 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 a comma there's a pause there at the end of that line that line has the is is indicated by the forward slash so dagla dang war jpe dra so so one thing that i've noticed over the years and, and bernie can speak to this much better than i because he studied the language much more than i have but um you can meet 20 different tibetans and you can have all these different words and everything and each one of those tibetans may come from a different part of tibet and they have a dialect so they may recite these words a little differently yeah so um so we choose to recite them the way they're presented to us here on this paper and so on but you know you may meet lamas you may meet other tibetans who pronounce it slightly differently and so on and you know that's the same here in the united states you can travel around the united states everybody's speaking the english language 
but in some places it seems indiscernible because of their dialects. So it's the same kind of a situation that we have, and in every big nation has that kind of situation of, of dialect. So um, I just point that out. So Dagla Dong War JP Draw. And the next line says, No par JP Gag. So the no, the N O, you notice that the O, that vowel, has a umlaut over it. The umlaut are those two little dots. And what it is, is a very short sound for that particular letter, in this case, an O. So we're not saying O, we're saying no, no, the, the N sound, and then a little bit of the O sound, no. If it would be an A, ah, if the umlaut would be over the A, it would be na, something like that. Or if it would be a U, because I think it's only on the um, the uh, the O and the U and maybe the A that I've seen that umlaut. So the uh, the uh, new sound and U would be N. So no, na, n, n. So no par, no par, jpe geg. And then there's the forward slash indicating what would be a pause in that word. So the gag, so so there we're using the gag has a hard G sound, ga, ga, gag. And that first line, we had the, the JP, J. So the J has a definite J sound, J. And some, some people will pronounce it like a G, a hard sound, a gay but we pronounce it as a J, JP. If anybody's got a question about this while I'm doing this, going through this, please uh, just interrupt. So then the next one, yes. Let me ask, is it JP Dra or JP Dre? Dra. Dra, thank you. JP Dra. Okay. Lance, how do you spell that word you're saying with the, the umlaut? umlaut? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, o M L I T L A T something like that. Do you know okay. Bernie? I can. I just want to make sure I know it oh, close enough to if I need to look it up. Or maybe it's know. a U. Uh, U M. Maybe um, it's a U M. Usually, if the uh, vowel fall, has an umlaut on it in a in the in the uh, what would you call it the uh, the uh, Americanized version of it. It means it's followed either by the letter S or D in the original Tibetan. That's the rule for changing the sound of the vowel. But I'm not familiar enough with this to say exactly what word is being translated there. Well, the, the question was, how do you spell the word umlaut? Oh, umlaut. That I know because I took German in college. Right. I mean, in high school. U -M -L -A -T. U T, umlaut. It's, say it again. U M. U M L A U T. A U T. Umlaut. Oh, okay. Umlaut. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. So that diacritical mark is called an umlaut. Yeah. If you see it in a Tibetan or a German text, it's called an umlaut. If you see it in an American text, it has a different name, but uh, it's that's neither here nor there. So. Okay. All right. So let's continue on. We were on the third line. So it says, Top, uh, Tarpa, 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 Dan, Kamshe, Genpe, Bardu, Jopar, J, Jopar, Jopar. You see the umlaut over the O and Jo, Jopar, Jepa, Tamshe, Gi, So, So, so jpay and then the forward slash so the word dong d-a-n-g that means the word in english that means and a-n-d oh. so there's a number of other words here but but to get a little bit familiar with some of these words is, is very interesting and there are some primers that if you're interested uh i've got 
I've got some language primers here and I can introduce you to where the source of these and and uh, there was a time when Bernie and I years ago were were working on you know translating these prayers um, using you know these primers using that and I, I'm a terrible student I'm terrible at language <laughs> you know uh, you can teach me something in three seconds it's gone in my mind <laughs> yeah we did the uh the aspiration to cement the Badr, as I recall, the Tibetan we translate right. that into English. Well, I can say a few of these words. Tarpa means liberation. Tamche means all. Ken means wisdom. Bardu is until. And the rest of it escapes me. So, Well, the word cho, C-H-O. Cho no, is dharma, and it has dharma. the cho ba. Paris means it puts it in the date of case. So I can't real. I my Tibetan is too too little to really give a good translation of that line, but I recognize yeah. some of the words. So um, I encourage you while we're talking about these things and going over this, you can use your pencil, you know, in this book, and you can make your own diacritic marks about how to pronounce these things if it's necessary. Please go ahead and do that. There's no reason why you shouldn't. You know, and I suggest a pencil because there may be a time that you want to change the way you do that or you just want to erase those marks because you've memorized how to do these things. But these are study texts. So uh, there's no problem with you writing in these textbooks. Okay, so that third line then was Topar, Dong, Tamshe, Kempe, Bardu, Chopar, Jepe, Tamshe, Gi, So, Jepe. Then the next line is Ma Namka Dang, Nyampe, Semchen, Tamshe, Dewa, Dangden. So that's pretty easy. That one uh, doesn't have too many uh, interesting words. So if you look at the um, the English translation now, and you can see how often the word um, and comes up, A-N-D. You can see how often Dharma comes up, the word Dharma comes up. And you can start making, you know, the, the associations between the Tibetan um, phonetics and, and the, the words in English. And then this last phrase uh, on this prayer is, Dugnao Dang Drel Nordu Lana Mepa Yang Dagpar Zogpe Zhangju Rinpoche Topar Zha. So Dug Dugnao. So now, so when you see that, it's it's um it, it, the D, the first letter there, or, or rather the N N Y A L, is is just a a, a slight sound. Nyao Nya. Now, now, you're saying the end, but it flows right into the Y sound. Now, so it's Doug now. So Doug, so it's not just a, 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 a D, like D-U-G would be Doug, Doug. This is a Doug now. So there's a little bit more of an aspiration uh, of, the, of the sound, a little bit more air when you're saying that D-H. U G D H Dugnau. So Dugnau Dang Drell Nordu. So there's the N Y again. Nordu N Nordu Nordu Lana Mepa Yang Dagpar Zogpe. So Zog. So here is the same thing that we've got the D is the first letter of the word the zug and you got the z sound and the o g zug zug so it's not just the zug like a, a like a z sound it's got a d in front of that zug zug now zug pay zug pay changju rinpoche topar ja topar so th topar ja so that j sound the rinpoche the word rinpoche 
means precious. So we usually see it as a honorific, as a as a um, a name that is given to a great master, a Rinpoche, who would be a, a Tulku, someone who has had reincarnations, that he's noted for his reincarnations, that is being a, a master and then uh, doing great works and then passes away, but then is reincarnated in another life. And, and the Rinpoche has made association with them. Also, those who may not have that tulku, uh, the tulku, the re reincarnated being, but they just become a great master in this lifetime. And maybe we don't know what their past lifetimes were, but as an honorific, we, we might refer to them as a Rinpoche, as a precious um, uh, being. So it comes at the end. So, so you might say like uh, um, Kenshin, Kenshin um, Rinpoche. Kenshin is the translator, is the man who did all these translations for us. Kenshin Kunchok Gyalchen Rinpoche is his name. So the Rinpoche comes at the end. So, um, so just some things to point out to you. Hmm. So um, the word Changshu, you see in this last uh, phrase here, this last uh, section that we were just talking about, the word Changshu, C-H-A-N-C-H-U-B, you see that? That means enlightenment. Or it could mean an, a bodhicitta. The, it, the Tibetan language is a contextual language. In other words, words may mean different things, depending on other words that are in the same sentence or phrase. So whether it means enlightenment or bodhicitta, you would see Jangju in being used for both of those things. And it would be more uh, understandable if we knew the other parts where it was in there. So I'll just point that out, just some things that are interesting that I've found. All right, so now let's go back and recite this, this prayer again in the Tibetan together out loud. Dagla Dangwar Jepe Dra, No Bar Jepe Geg, Tarpa Dang Tam She Ken Pe Bar Du Jop Bar Jepa Tam She Ki So Jepe. Ma Nam Ka Dam Yam Pe Sem Chen Tam She De Wa Dang Den. Dug now, dang drell nor do la na me pa yang dag pa zog pe zhang zhu bin po she to pa zha. So I'm certainly far from perfect in this, but uh, we all need to do our best. <clears throat> okay, any questions or comments about the altruistic motivation prayer? Okay, so then we move to the action bodhicitta prayer. So the action bodhicitta prayer, the English is, thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. So I really think this is quite self-evident. I don't know if there's anything that I can explain that isn't really here in these, these words, but we can see that it is through our body, speech, and mind, om, ah, hong, when we are doing this, we are being mindful of our body, speech, and mind becoming inseparable from the body, speech, and mind of the enlightened one. So to whatever degree that we are successful in that, you know, brings happiness, brings a degree of enlightenment. We're using whatever bodhicitta we can. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment. But until I achieve that enlightenment, I'm being mindful of the bodhicitta. And I perform these deeds with my body, speech, and mind. Until death, I do this. And from now until this time tomorrow, 
tomorrow never comes. So I will continue doing this, you know, and putting myself in the present, you know, that I'm, uh, the present is all we have. The past is gone. Tomorrow never comes. All we have is now. So everything I will do will be bodhicitta for the benefit of all sentient beings. So this is what, so the title of this prayer is Action Bodhicitta. So buddy is Sanskrit word that means enlightenment. And chitta is a Sanskrit word that means the heart mind, the heart mind, not the fleshy heart, but the heart mind, our true nature here. So the enlightened heart mind that I always like to think has heart thoughts, that we have these heart mind thoughts. Here in our brain, we have brain thoughts, brain thoughts. We have heart thoughts. These heart thoughts are our spiritual thoughts, are the thoughts that we can transmit to other beings and so on. Here with our brain thoughts, we have to use our voice. We have to use our speech in order to communicate that, our actions and so on. But through the heart, it's that vibration. It's that vibration that we harmonize with. So the action is putting this bodhicitta to action. That I will do this, I perform virtuous deeds with my body, speech, and mind now and uh, until my death and uh, until tomorrow and tomorrow never comes. Okay, so the Tibetan in this is uh, De She Du they she do sang ma ke ki bardu lunag yisam gewa la ko. So de she do sang ma ge ma ge g y ye ye ma ge ki k um k y i k y i ki Ki. Sometimes we'll see uh, another word is uh, K Y E. So it's more like K, K, K. So Ki. Bardu Lunag. So here, the word with the N and the G A G. So we're trying to get that N sound in. Nag, Nag. Yisam Gewa. La Kol. Then the next line is Mashe Bardu Lunag Yisam Gewa La Kol. And the third line is Du De Ring Ne Sungte Nima Sangta Samgi Bardu Lunag Yisam Gewa La Kol. So um, this word sam, T-S-A-M, so it's sam, not sam like S-A-M, but it's a more of a, a, your tongue goes behind your teeth and sam, sam, sam. Samgi, bardu, lunagi, samge, wa, la, kol. Is this being helpful or are we... We move in a forward direction on this? Okay. All right. So let's recite this prayer together in the English one time, and then we go and recite it in the Tibetan one time. So we all do it out loud, although our microphones may be muted. So we begin. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Deshe du sangma ge gi bardu lu nagi sam ge wa la ko. Ma she bardu lu nagi sam ge wa la ko. 
Dude, ring, ne, song, te, ni, ma, sang, ta, sam, gi, bar, du, lu, na, gi, sam, ge, wa, la, ko. So what I'm trying to do is giving each one of these words a the same kind of beat, the same kind of value. So I'm 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 just chanting them, you know, not making it a sing song melody kind of a thing. But every when we do a chant, it's just pretty much every word is got the same got the same uh, time value to it. They say do sang ma ge gi boy do lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. So you can take your hands and you can beat your desk. Sang ge chai do sang ge, excuse me. They say do sang ma ge gi boy do lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Ma she boy do lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Do de ring ne song te ni ma sang ta sam gi bar du lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Okay. Okay, so then the long refuge prayers. So this is a, so the refuge prayers. The refuge means we're taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. We're taking refuge in the in the three jewels. We're taking refuge in the, the Dharma. We're taking refuge in the Sangha, the community of people. We're taking refuge in the mind of the Buddha. So when we do this, to help us be mindful of that, we're holding the, the three jewels in our hand at our heart like this. So we take our thumbs and put them inside our palms like this. We're not holding tight. And um, so this is the reason why we do this. And we particularly do this in a refuge prayer. The first two prayers were not refuge prayers. They were aspirational prayers. You know, so we don't necessarily do that. But out of respect, when the song is all together and we're doing this, we we will cup our hands like this and, and do this, but it's uh, only really required when you're doing a refuge prayer. That's the time that you do this. So this long refuge prayer. So in English it says, we take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Okay, so this bears a little bit of conversation. So we take refuge, we take comfort. Our home is our refuge. This is our home. This is we're taking refuge in this. When everything gets confused and we, we're losing our focus, we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the, the three jewels. And this brings us to our spirituality, to the essence of who we are, to our true nature, in the heart center here, our, our big mind, all this. Up here is all contrived. Up here is all fabricated. But our love is here in our heart center. And so this is where the three jewels are. So we take refuge in the th in the kind root and lineage lamas. So the kind root lama, your kind root lama, the root lama is said to be the, the teacher, the one who introduces you to the nature of your mind, the true nature of your mind. So that true nature, you know, to me, you know, is this heart center, understanding that you are part of everything that we see, all phenomenal nature, and that all that is part of you, that it's indistinguishable, that the appearances are what we get hung up on, that there is something different 
something better than than we are or something or or we're better than something else or all these appearances but these are all mental fabrications but in our heart center it's all the same because in our heart center is also the the absolute truth we have the relative truth but it's in the heart center that we have the absolute truth and the relative truth so to try and recognize the absolute truth with our brain we can't do it because it's non-dual it is it is uh, non-conceptual the brain works with concepts without the concepts it's it's too nebulous for us it's too it's too vague for us but we experience it through our heart connection so the kind root lama the kind root teacher is the one who is introducing you to that and you can have many root lamas you know as you go through your career of being a a, a practitioner of being a yogi and so on you you have your initial teachers and so on like that and they help you to whatever degree they can and then you may say okay i've been introduced to this other teacher or these other teachings and i want to move to them that's perfectly fine and then they introduce you maybe to another facet of your true nature of your mind so they're showing you another route there's not just one route it's not all like just a a single carrot it's more like a tree that has many many roots that are going out into the out into the earth you know so it's not just one it can be just one if that if if, if that's that's okay but you can have many this is the point i'm trying to make so the kind root and the lineage lamas are all the different lamas all the different teachers of the lineage that you may be part of so i think that we're all part of the lineage of shakyamuni buddha shakyamuni buddha is the historical buddha that lived 2600 years ago that all these teachings and so on came from and so on and then he's had all these disciples all these students over the many many generations and they have gone into different lineages with their masters and so on like that and they're all part of the same lineage of shakyamuni buddha but then the lineage masters where that was founded they may have that lineage master who founded like we have the in the drikung kagyu in our lineage um lord jigden sumgun founded this lineage so uh so all the masters that came after um uh jigden sumgun would be the lineage um lamas that are associated with that particular lineage so you can go and you can you know you can cross over to different lineages you're not bound to just one lineage you can be a holder of the lineage practices of many different practices from different lineages and so on, but they all come from Shakyamuni Buddha. So we say, I take refuge in the kind root Lama and the lineage Lamas of our lineage or, or whatever lineages we're part of, whatever lineages we'd like to be part of. We're, we're understanding the, the way in which this kind of a hierarchy kind of works. And the next line says, we take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yidams. So these deities are these um, within ourselves. Um, you know, I've talked many times that, that it's like this indestructible diamond that has many facets to it. And each one of these facets is one of the different deities who all have bodhicitta, these diamonds made up of bodhicitta, and that bodhicitta is is shining through, is coming through, uh, and what differentiates these Buddhas, these uh, enlightened beings, is their actions, their enlightened activities. So the deities are that. That's what's being expressed. These enlightened ones, the enlightened ones, are the deities. It's not something out there. It's not a deity like a god or a goddess, something like that. It is within ourselves. 
So recognizing this within ourselves. And um, so as we do these different practices, we begin to develop an awareness of that. So we take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yidams. So the mandalas are the uh, palaces of those deities. So we've talked about this a few times. I've showed you some illustrations of that. Um, this is a, a mandala of Medicine Buddha. So this is two, two directions. This is only uh, two dimensions here. Uh, but it actually is a three-dimensional object um, like this. So this is the three-dimensional object of what this is trying to portray. If you look at it like this, it looks like this card. But if I turn the card up and I turn this, this uh, mandala up, the stupa up, then you can see that there's a third dimension to it. So these are their, uh, their palaces. And within their palaces are all the associated spiritual sons and daughters, spiritual friends, the different layers of enlightened ones, Dakinis, Bodhisattvas, etc., and so on, and associated Buddhas, associated enlightened ones. So that's what's represented by the different levels here, the different steps and terraces that are that are in the uh, that are being portrayed in the two-dimensional mandala. So, if you get the opportunity, you know, to look at these things and to um, to uh, if you come to um, uh, Dharma Surya in the next couple of weeks, because I've told you that there's going to be two retreats that are going on these next two weekends, uh, you'll see all these things will be there. And uh, the third week, or the second week, excuse me, of, um, of November, the Sarah J. Monks are going to be there, and they are going to be constructing a sand mandala. This is one of the, the mandalas that they made a number of years ago. This is a, a photograph of it, but it actually is very three-dimensional with grains of sand that they build up and so on. It's not very deep, but you get to recognize the, the, the textual nature of this. So perhaps you take the advantage to go and see that. So the deities of the mandalas, the deities of the mandalas of the Yidams. So the Yidams are the tutelary deities. Tutelary it means they are our tutors. That it's through their teachings, it's through you're doing their practices, through you becoming, transforming yourself into th their being, into their presence, and that you become those deities, those yidams, that they are teaching you what it is to be an enlightened being. So they are pure. We are impure. The way that we overcome our impurity is by purification and how do we purify what do we do as we do purify what are our activities it's through those practices that we learn how to do that they are our examples they are the tutelary deities that we're we're, we're seeing this so another way of looking at this is is through their prism or through their eyes through their being, that you're seeing this manifestation of phenomenal nature through their eyes. And you see this now as, as their Buddha field. We see it as our Buddha field, through their eyes, through their being, and so on like that. So the Yidams are teaching that to us. So through their mandala, through their activities, through all these things coming together, you see, are all different... Um, techniques to be able to become mindful to develop the understanding and the uh, comprehension of what all this is, all the, the teachings and so on. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. So these Buddhas, there's not just one Buddha. There's Buddha Shakyamuni who brought all this to us 
who um, uh, um, who uh, articulated all of this through his uh, compassion and through his wisdom and so on was able to um, convey this to us and so on but he is one of many many buddhas of the past of the very d- distant past and then during his time there had been many buddhas many buddhas who followed the path of the of buddha shakyamuni who attained enlightenment and then there's many more who since the buddha has passed and those masters have passed that there's a continuing buddhas all the time so we're meeting buddhas we're reading about buddhas we we may not recognize that or not but um they are um, it is all amongst us we begin to see as we develop and we raise up through the levels of our purification we're purifying and we see that everything is on that buddha field as everything becomes that buddha field that even the things that we once would have thought of as being very negative or something now all of a sudden becomes pure because of being on the path because seeing it as a buddha so there's a lot of teaching there's a lot of discussion about that but uh for right now we want to say that we take refuge in all these exalted buddhas and remember the word buddha is the sanskrit word for awakened one so it's if we are waking from darkness we are awaking from sleep We are awaking from ignorance. And then all of a sudden now, everything lights up. Everything becomes illuminated and we can see everything for its true nature. That everything is pure. Everything is Buddha field. Everything is is natural. So these exalted Buddhas are, they're exalted because they have realized this, that they have become awakened. And they did this on their own. Each one of these Buddhas had to achieve this, had to attain this level of awakeness through their own efforts. It wasn't that like lightning struck them and all of a sudden they became endowed with all this wisdom and compassion. It was that they had to purify themselves because all of this is the human being story. It's the human being story. So uh, we all have that potential. We all have Buddha nature within us. We're all human beings. And, and so what we're trying to do is to complete ourselves as human beings by coming to our, to our, uh, um, our, our, um, our exalted nature, our pure nature, the exalted nature of being an awakened one. So we take refuge in that. Then the next line says, we take refuge in the perfect Dharma. So the Dharma here has a capital D. And if you remember, the Dharma is a Sanskrit word that means a pathway. So in a lowercase d, it would mean there's many different pathways. There's parent, there's pathways to become a parent. There's pathways to become a doctor. There's parent, uh, pathways to become a carpenter. There's pathways to become uh, a teacher so many all the different vocations that we are exposed to are all dharmas lowercase d but the buddha dharma the the path of the buddha is expressed with the capital d dharma this is the buddha dharma so the buddha when he attained enlightenment wanted to be able to share this with other beings and realize that there's no way to be able to 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 express the enlightenment there's no way to express it we have to experience it for ourselves just as he had to experience it himself so the only thing that he could teach was how he did it how he was able to attain enlightenment and that's the dharma the buddha dharma what his path what his method of going through all the different changes all the different purifications that he went through all the different obstacles that had to be overcome all of that all the positive the negative everything coming all together onto the path of enlightenment 
is the Dharma. So this is the speech of the Buddha. So the, the Buddha is the mind of the Buddha. When we talk about Buddha Shakyamuni, we're talking about the mind of the Buddha, the big mind, but then the articulation of that pathway is the Dharma, the speech of the Buddha, the intellectualization. How do I get these people to understand this? Well, let me show you some of the artwork we use, and let me show you some of the tools we use, and let me show you some of the methods that we use. Let me show you all these different things, these techniques that we use in order to help us to recognize who we are, where we are, and why we're here, and how it is that we got here, and how it is that we liberate ourselves. So we've got all these tools and everything, and all this is all part of the Dharma. So we take refuge in the perfect Dharma. So we regard this Dharma as being perfect, that this is, this is what is leading us to indestructible wisdom, indestructible wisdom, the wisdom that, that we have within ourselves, that, is, that, that the Buddha is symbolic of, this wisdom of understanding all this in its in its absolute form and its perfect form, perfect or um, its perfect nature would be better to say it because in its nature it has a form. So um, so we're 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 using these different devices to recognize the form and making the associations with the realizations that we go through of that absolute nature. So this is the perfect Dharma. I take refuge in the perfect Dharma. And the next one is we take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. So the three jewels are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So the Buddha is the mind of the Buddha, the Dharma is the speech of the Buddha, the intellectualization of the Buddha. And then the Sangha is the community of the Buddha, the body of the Buddha. So what this means is all those that are on this pathway, that are in this Dharma, to attain enlightenment. So when we talk about the noble Sangha, we're talking about the eight great bodhisattvas. So we've talked about them a number of times, and we talked about them, their, their, their names, I don't need to go into it right now, but, but there was the cultivation of, of uh, wisdom, the cultivation of bodhicitta, it was the, the grace of the bodhicitta, the loving kindness of bodhicitta, it was the transformation, it was the, the devotion, it was the compassion, it was the wisdom, it was the purification, and it was the power of the Dharma in order that we can traverse the pathway to become a Buddha, to become a Bodhisattva, etc., to get to be a Buddha, and so on. So the excellent order of the Sangha are those eight great bodhisattvas, which are the highest qualities of being a human being. The highest qualities of being a human being. As we are approaching that, we're not there yet, of course, but as we are approaching that, we become the ordinary Sangha. The ordinary Sangha, those like us who have been practicing this, who are reciting these prayers, who are doing the different sadhana practices, having these discussions, going to the, uh, to the temples and so on, and, and interacting with each other and so on. This is the ordinary Sangha. Our, our Dharma brothers and sisters <clears throat> that we're sharing with, that we're doing this, and, and they're like our guides as well. You know, we have conversations. We say, oh, I, I've been having trouble with this, or oh, I had this experience. What do you think of this? And we're talking among ourselves and so on. And this can include also the lamas, our teachers, you know, the, the kempos and the, the drupans and so on that we meet, the different lamas and so on, includes them as the ordinary sangha because they are not, you know, fully realized beings themselves. They've had they've had glimpses, and there may be some that that may be 
Buddha's now, maybe Bodhisattva's now, there may be that too. You may meet them and uh, they, they are around. And, uh, and I think, you know, uh, I've certainly met a few. I know exactly what that is. And uh, so anyway, so we look at all of this as, as the community of the Buddha, of the awakened one, of being awakened, that we're all awakened ones, recognizing that by some degree, we're more awakened than other beings, but we're not as awakened as other beings. But we don't disparage ourselves, we don't disparage others because they're not at the highest level at any given time. So we have forgiveness, we have grace, we have loving kindness, we have gratefulness that we've been able to do what we are doing now. So this is, we take refuge in the excellent order of the sanghas, of the community, and especially the noble sangha, the eight great bodhisattvas, because they become, they are like our heroes. And it's through them that we're learning how to traverse that path more and more efficiently, more and more perfectly. And so on. without them, we'd be fumbling around and losing our way and falling off the path and having to get back on and so on. But it's the teachings of the, the noble Sangha that keeps us on the path. And if we do falter, brings us right back onto the path. So then this next line says, we take refuge in all the noble Dakas Dakinis and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. So this is all the other enlightened beings, the Dharma protectors, the Dakinis. So um, the Dakas and Dakinis, the Dakinis are, are referred to as the, uh, the skyfarers. And these are, are beings that um, are, um, it's like energy that is moving and when we are ready to hear that energy, when we're ready to hear that song that they are singing, all of a sudden our ears open up and our eyes open up and our smell opens up and we begin to recognize uh, these precious songs, these precious words, but they're not the same words, they're not the same kind of language, they're not the same kind of beings as we are looking at each other and like ourselves. They are spiritual beings that are coming through and as part of that harmonizing vibration and so on that we are, we are trying to align ourselves with and so on. So they manifest in different ways. There's a whole other teaching that can go on for a weekend talking about the different Dakinis and the Dakas. So the Dakinis are the female aspects of this and the, the Dakas are the male aspects of this. So the females are the wisdom aspect and the Dakas are the skillful means aspect, the method aspect of, of doing and so on. So we take refuge in these noble Dakas and Dakinis and the Dharma guardians. The Dharma guardians are those beings who are seeing to it that the Dharma is made available in these books, is being made available in the teachings, is being made available in the temples and so on. So it's kind of like, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we have the presence of, of some divine, um, nature within ourselves that gives us this power to be able to do these things to to know how to to print these things to know how to uh talk about these things to teach these things to know how to build the buildings and so on so all the structure all the physical stuff that is that is holding all this stuff together for us in this phenomenal world so that we can uh, begin to um, gather it together and accumulate the wisdom and the, and the method to be able to understand this and to be able to become the embodiment of the bodhicitta itself. So these are the Dharma guardians that are doing this. And again, there's many different uh, aspects about this that we could talk about. But generally, we're talking about those enlightened beings who are on the path to become enlightened. They're not Buddhas. They're not 
that they're not fully realized. They're not like the high buddy sattvas, but they're on the path to that. So we in this lifetime, we may be parts of these. We may we may find ourselves at some part of our lives as becoming dakinis or becoming dakas or becoming dharma guardians. And we may spend the rest of our lives being that dharma guardian or being that dakini or being that daka. And so, so we can transform into these enlightened beings that are on the path. And the, and as they become that, they're more concentrated of that true nature than than we are right now. You know, we're very, you know, we're we're still prone to so many other afflictive emotions and so on and confusions. But those dharma protectors and dakinis are much more concentrated, and they have a work to do. We talked about you know giving our ego a job to do. Well, this is you know part of that. That's a way of of expressing it, just using, you know, these ideas to be able to help express this, to help grasp what we're talking about. So all these beings that we've been talking about, the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, the um, the Dakas and the Dakinis and the Dharma Guardians, all of them have the eye of wisdom, the eye of wisdom. And the eye of wisdom is, is usually, you know, uh, pointed out as as being in the forehead as having that eye that 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 spiritual eye that sees through things this these see all the mundane things these regular eyes see all the physical stuff but this seizes the cause of the suffering seizes the cause of the happiness sees the causes of the transformation and how to do all this sees all this with this wisdom eye so you'll see as you meet different dakinis or, or excuse me, as you meet the, the different deities and so on in the different practices, some of them, you know, very clearly have this third eye, have this wisdom eye. So uh, this is what this is referring to. We have the wisdom eye ourselves, but it may be dormant right now. It hasn't been uh, awoken. It hasn't been uh, realized. So as we progress along, that wisdom eye becomes much more prominent and we begin to see with that wisdom eye. Any questions or comments? I'm sorry for talking so long, but I don't know how to do it any other way. This is a very important prayer and really talks to us about, explains so much to us. So that's why I thought it important to be able to spend this time on that. I have a question. Um, the the uh, Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, is that something that was present in Indian Buddhism? Or is that something that, when it came to Tibet, was something culturally Tibetan that they incorporated into Buddhism and, uh, like, you know, with other kind of forms? Um, I can't say for sure. Um, Bernie, do you have an answer for that? Uh Dakas and Dakinis are part of Tantric Buddhism, so they would be found in Tantric Buddhism in India as well as in uh, Tibet. So no, they didn't originate in Tibet. It's the idea. Uh, well, to explain what the Dakas and Dakinis signify, it's the idea of enlightenment as bliss. That there's no separate... We normally talk about wisdom, but there's also the aspect of bliss when we talk about enlightenment. And the Dakas and the Kinis represent the bliss aspect of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Bernie, can, can you say what anything else of what you mean when you say that they represent it? I'm not the world's biggest experts on Dakas and the Kinis, but generally they're seen in uh, Indian Buddhism as protectors of the tantric teachings. And they are sort there's of. A, there's a Hindu tantra as well. Of course, Hindu Tantra as well, all Tantras, Hindu and Buddhist, but uh, the idea is that the Dakas and Dakinis are sort of uh, fierce, but at the same time, they grant uh, the uh, understanding of, uh, of the Tantric teachings. Uh, they're sort of like viewed as the protectors of the Tantric teachings, and you have uh, the idea of protectors in, in Tantric Buddhism as well. 
but I really couldn't give you a really wonderful explanation of the Kinis and Dakas off the top of my head. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think for, I don't know, for me, I always struggle with, with some of this stuff, the Dakas, the Kinis, the Dhamma Guardians, the Nagas, like some of this stuff, which uh, to me, I'd just put a pin in it. And at some point, I think it'll probably mean something to me that it doesn't now. Well, I, well the I, idea is that there are enlightened beings out there, but they don't always have the aspect of a peaceful Buddha. Mm -hmm. Enlightenment can come in di different forms. And uh, to some people, they might, so the forms might not be so peaceful. They might be seen as threatening. And the Dharma protectors and the Dakas and the Dakinis, uh, Dharma guardians, Dharma protectors, they represent, uh, it says here, possessing the wisdom eye of knowledge, uh, meaning that uh, not all beings like this are enlightened, but those which are enlightened uh, are also we can take refuge in, just like we can take refuge and the enlightened sangha, we can take refuge in enlightened beings who are outside of the sangha, but who aren't Buddhas in the traditional sense, and that they are teaching the Dharma the way the Buddha would teach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the way I look at that question is that, you know, there is energy, and we're physical, you know matter so there's energy and physical matter and we are the embodiment of energy but that energy vibrates at different levels operates at different levels and so on and that you probably have met people that have a very high energy level they're the embodiment of that and they may use it for good they may use it for bad you know so so Dakas and Dakinis and Dharma guardians and so on, they are the embodiment of energy. They're human beings. It's human beings. It's not somebody that comes and, and, and flies around or something like that. It's not that. It's, hu it's human beings. All this is human beings. And so um, you can have these Dakini thoughts. You can have these Dhaka thoughts, you can have these Dharma guardian thoughts, and, and you act on them and do them as human beings. So it's the embodiment of that energy, that, that the pure energy, that positive energy, not negative energy. Bernie said that sometimes, you know, it, they will show, you know, some kind of wrathfulness or some kind of anger, but it is a, it is a, um, anger or it is a wrathfulness for the benefit of overcoming the negativity of other beings that need that kind of fierceness i prefer to use the word fierce rather than wrathful their their fierceness has to be greater than that negativity that's being presented to them so they may appear to have a a a, a very fierce appearance but you're doing it in order to subdue the negativity and to be able to transform that negativity within themselves or to help other beings to do it within themselves. An example of that would be your parents. You know, as you were growing up and so on and you were doing the things that young kids do, whether you're, you know, two months old or, or, or five years old or 15 years old, you know, um, your parents, could rise up to to be able to show you that that um, that uh, what, what do you call it the um, the love you know fearful uh, uh, fierce love you know that they need to do to make sure that you don't hurt yourself. So it, it's kind of like so I look at it like that. It's within yourself. All this is within yourself. To be able to look for these things, the more we do these practices, the more we get introduced them. There's a whole lot of things you haven't been introduced to yet, but you'll find that these things are all within yourself. The complexities of who you are, of who we are as human beings, the the potentials that we have, and so on. Okay.
Thank you, Lance. This is great. It's Alex here. And Thank you, Alex. Reminded me, uh, isn't there several major kinds of the kinis? Right now, I remember uh, like awareness the kinis, but there are certainly others. I think. Yeah, we don't have time to go into that right now. But yes, there's different levels of dakinis and so on. So there's the enlightened dakinis, and then there's a a middle level of dakini, and then there's the the average everyday kind of a dakini, and so on. So when we have more time to talk about them in in um, through a practice, in other words, instead of just talking about it intellectually, but actually introducing you to a practice in which you can begin to experience this yourself, that's where it'll make the most sense. Okay, so we're taking refuge in this. This is the long refuge prayer we call this because we're taking refuge in, in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, plus the palace, plus the Dakinis, and, and so on like that. So unless somebody else has another question, we'll go to the Tibetan. So it should be getting easier. You should be recognizing these words a little bit more the way in which these words are, are working. So it starts off Drin Sen, Sawa Dang, Gurpar, J Pei. So you see that Pei, P A with an apostrophe I. So it's kind of like a Pei. So um, if it was P A Y, it might be Pei. Pay. This is a pay. It's a shorter, you know. It ends. It ends. Uh, it doesn't have that aspiration at the end. It's uh, J pay. Paldan Lama Dampa Namla Kabsu Chio Kabsu. So Kab Kab K Y Kab Kab. So you're starting off with the K sound, but you're getting that Y sound in there. Kyab, kyab su, chio, chio. Um, then the next line is yidam kyogorgi lasok namla kyab su chio. Sange chom den. See the the umlaut over the O. Chom den, de namla. Kyabsu chi o. I point out to you the word sange in that third line there, sange. That is the Tibetan word for Buddha. So when you see sange, that means Buddha. So you'll see uh, sange menla is medicine Buddha. Sange, um, no, right now my mind. I can't think of more examples right now, sorry. But Sange Chom Den De Nam Kabsu Chio. Then the next line is Dam Pei. Pei, again, P A apostrophe I, Pei. Cho, so it's Dharma. Cho, C H Omlat O. Namla Kabsu Chio. Pag Pei. Gendun, Namla, Kabsu, Chio. So here I point out to you Pagpe. Pag in Tibetan, they say pe, uh, PH with, a, with as a P sound, not as an F sound. In English and maybe other languages, I, I don't know, but it's not, a, we, you know, we would look at it and say, oh, Fagpe because that's what we're used to seeing PH. But in Tibetan, it's Pagpe. So there's no, so we don't transform that into an F sound. It is a PH sound, Pagpe. Pagpe, Gedun, Namla, Kyabsu, Chiyo. Pawo, Kanjo, Chokyong, Songme, Sog, Yeshe, Gi, Chengdang, Dempa, Namla, Kabsu Chio. Any questions about any of that? Anything need to be repeated, uh, explained? So it's a matter of, of practicing this. You know, maybe, you know, with this discussion, you will be more motivated to want to practice this and, and do well with it. And remember, we've got the recordings of 
uh, Kenshin Rinpoche and, and Kenpo Soltram together reciting this. Plus there's recordings of my doing it in my Baltimore accent. So uh, you can have that benefit as well. <laughs> I hope it's not a, li a liability. All right, so what we should do now is uh, recite this once in English and then in the Tibetan. So if you have a, any sticking points, uh, just let's talk about them. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yilams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Drinsen, Sawa, Dang, Gurpa, Jepe, Paldan, Lama, Dampa, Namla, Kabsu, Chiyo. Yidam Kilgor Gi Lasok Namla Kabsu Chiyo Sange Chomden De Namla Kabsu Chiyo Dampe Cho Namla Kabsu Chiyo Pagpe Gedun Namla Kabsu Chiyo Pavo Kanjo Chokyong Songme Song Yeshe Gi Chengdang Dempa Namla Kabsu Chiyo so we see that there's different meters to these different lines, the different how many how many beats there are per line. So some of these are like run on sentences. So we just recite it as the same way, like that last line there was Pawo, Kanjo, Chokyong, Song Mei, Song Yeshe Gi, Cheng Deng, Dempa, Namla, Kabsu, Chiyo. So it's a matter of getting familiar with, with that. I got a question. Do you think chanting these things, doing these in this very choppy way is, is helpful or do you prefer the melodies? As a tutorial, I prefer the choppiness because it overemphasizes and enunciates our common mistakes in pronunciation. Okay, good. All right, good. But is there a value to the melodies? In practice, I found great value in the melodies in ways I've mentioned this, one of the other groups that I didn't expect to, that it, um, I don't know, it's fun. It, like it just the chanting of it, or sometimes I'll just like, like I want to do it. And, you know, like I feel like doing it more than watching YouTube or something, like in a weird way where there's something about it that I would never would have got because it has like a more of an emotional devotional thing for me that it creates. And part of not knowing the, the exactly what the meaning of the words, I know they were like what the prayers mean, kind of, but that somehow almost makes it better for me. I don't know, it makes it less conceptual or something, but it's um it's actually opened things up. It's made me want to start practicing deity yoga more like it's it's really opened things up for me in a way I would have never expected. And and even just like in my original uh, time practicing Dharma a long time ago, before I kind of stopped and I ended up coming to this group, I I was never a fan of prayers in general. It was always to me, I was always like, Ugh, when are we going to get over this, get past this, I have to pay my my toll of doing these prayers so I can get to the teaching or something interesting to me. But um, but uh, that's a you know, long-winded way of saying doing it for me, at least in that melody and the chanty kind of thing has... Uh, been really beneficial yeah it's very good yeah i agree with you i i i enjoy the melodies and uh and i think the the melody you know it's like in the english you know a lot of people like to take the english translation and they like to versify it they call it versifying it to versify it means that they do it in the same kind of chanting melody as the sanskrit there we go. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yadams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. To me, that's, uh, I, I prefer the melody because 
the English language, you know, it present it's presented in a in a you know in a way that maybe it evokes some kind of an emotion or something like that, but I don't see it as a as a bad thing. So I don't know if that's another way of saying what you were saying, Matt, but uh, I enjoy it more that way. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, I, I definitely think it's easier to learn without, you know, going through it without the, like, to Zara's point, but, um, yeah, cool. All right, well, let's see if we can get through this one, this this next one, because this one is probably one of the most important of these prayers that we have. This is called Taking the Bodhisattva Vow or sometimes cultivating bodhicitta, cultivating the bodhisattva vow. So this is, as it says, it's taking the bodhisattva vow. So encapsulated in these, you know, 12 or 14 lines here is, is the aspiration, is the taking the vow, making the promise to become a bodhisattva. So it really has a lot of meaning to it. So we start off by reciting the English. It says, until I attain enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. So this is the promise that we're making. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment. So and so we attain enlightenment. We're already enlightened beings. We're more enlightened than many other beings. We're not as enlightened as some other beings, but we have a high degree of enlightenment already. So until I attain the heart of that enlightenment, until I reach that true nature and stabilize, we will have glimpses of that true nature. But until I'm able to stabilize that, in other words, to be a Buddha, until that, until I attain that heart of enlightenment of being a Buddha, I take refuge in all the other Buddhas and all the Buddhas that we know of all the meditational Buddhas, all the Buddhas like Buddha Shakyamuni, the Buddhas like Garchan Rinpoche, all the different Buddhas that have been in the past, present, and future. And from that point of view of being a Buddha, there's no time. There's no past, present, or future. There's no location. They are all omnipresent. It is all here, all right now. It is all within us. And what we need to do is to remove the blockages that is keeping us from realizing that true nature of what that is, becoming awakened of what that is. So I take refuge in all the Buddhas that are within ourselves, that, that, that holy diamond, that, that precious diamond that we have within ourselves, which is only a, a symbol. It's just a metaphor. It's not a real diamond or anything like that. It's a metaphor. So, but it's a helpful metaphor. So I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma. So the Buddha Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, how to attain enlightenment, what it is to be on the path, et cetera, et cetera. I take refuge in the Dharma. And likewise, I take refuge in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. So the assembly of the bodhisattvas are the eight great bodhisattvas that we've been talking about, because it's through them that we learn what it is to be a realized human being, to go through the stages. It's through their example of, of how to become, uh, uh, to purify ourselves, to become a, a complete and uh, human being, and then to become bodhisattva, then to reveal ourselves as being buddies, uh, as Buddhas. So then the next stanza says, as the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the bodhisattva's path. So this is a, a key sentence here. As the previous Buddhas, all the previous Buddhas, 
all those that we can think about, the great masters, Nagarjuna and uh, Maitreya and, and um, um, Milarepa and Marpa and Padmadrupa, all these great beings, all these previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind as they were doing this, as they were going through their progression to become Buddhas, they progress, they, they, how they embraced the enlightened mind, the heart mind, they progressed on the Bodhisattva's path. They went on the same pathway that we're learning about and so on. That, and we talked about the, the, the 10 Bhumis in the Jewel Ornament Liberation, and they're articulated what that is. And each level is a, is a purification level of what it is a, as a human being to become more perfect as a as a as a uh, human being and ultimately to become a bodhisattva then finally to become a buddha and so on how they progressed on this level we're all the same it all starts out by being a human being i too for the benefit of all sentient beings that their that their motivation was for human beings our motivation is for human beings. It's not something that we invented. It's not something that we've been doing just for the past 50 years. It's not something that, would, that Buddhists have been doing for the past thousand years. It's something that has always been like that, that there's always been beings, even before there was language, there's been beings who were always trying to help others. You know, you get 20 or 30 people together as a group. And if they're moving around, you know that there's different personalities within that group. And you can go from one group to another all around the world, different places and so on. And you take 20 or 30 people and you'll find the same personalities in those groups. They'll be the real aggressive ones. They'll be the ones who are very laid back. They're very good followers. They'll be the ones who are always helping other people and so on. So it's very natural to want to, to be those beings. It's very natural to want to help other beings, as our mother did. Once a woman becomes a mother, everything changes for her. No matter where she was before that, once she becomes a mother, or to say it another way, once a parents have children, things change. Everything changes in our Everything becomes focused on that child. So we look at that that our relationship with other beings is like being a mother so i too for the benefit of all sentient beings because they're all my mother and i'm i'm a mother too who wants to take care of my children that i give birth to bodhicitta so there is giving birth there is the mother activity the unique mother activity that gives birth I give birth to bodhicitta. So that bodhicitta has to go through a gestation process. It has to develop within the body. You know, as we are human beings, it takes us nine months to be able to, to finally get all everything that we need to be born. So of course, some of us are born earlier, some born later and everything, but, but it's just the point that there is this period of gestation. There's this period of of learning this is pure of uh, uh, gaining strength and so on that i give birth to bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path so now i'm born now i'm born with bodhicitta and i apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path why are we here are we here to be a carpenter are we here to be just a parent? Are we here to be a, a doctor? Are we here to be a, a, a delicatessen counterman or, or whatever you can think of? Is that what our purpose is? Or do we have a spiritual person to be here to apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path to, uh, to accomplish the highest part of being a human being? The, heart, the, the, the highest accomplishment of being a human being, to attain Buddhahood. So 
So this prayer, taking the Bodhisattva vow, is a reminder for ourselves that this is what our purpose is. This is what we're doing. We're taking this vow every day that we recite this. So that's why it's so important, because all these prayers are remembrances to ourselves. We're not praying to something out there. We're not beseeching the God of rain or the the God of sunshine or the God who gives birth and everything. We're not praying to, all this is within ourselves. We're remembering that this is to ourselves. So this is a very, very, very important distinction of, of understanding the responsibility that we have to ourselves and to all other beings. That this is, we are part of this, this, this cosm of life, this, this celebration, this, this display of, of the true nature of, of phenomenal, of, 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 of absolute nature that displays itself in the phenomenal nature. So now we recite the Tibet. Does anybody have a question about the English? Okay. So now the Tibet. So Zhangzhou. So here's another spelling for Zhangzhou. It's J-A-N-G-U-B. So it means the same thing, enlightenment or um, or bodhicitta, the enlightened mind. Changju. So the spelling is different, and uh, depending on who you know did this particular translation for these, may have been a different person doing different translations. And one person always spells it as ch, the other one always spells it as j. It just can be as arbitrary as that. Actually, it represents the different pronunciations in different parts of Tibet. In some parts, they pronounce it as a j, and the other parts they pronounce it as a ch. So, okay, it depends what part of uh, Tibet they're from, how it's going to be uh, uh, phoneticized is the word I was looking at for before. But, but the meaning is the same. It's the same. It's it's the same Tibetan word underneath. Actually, right. Jongchub is spelled B Y A N G, Jong. Chub, I think, is straightforward C H U B. B, but I might be wrong there. Okay. But I know Zhang is B Y A N G in the literal Tibetan. Okay. Thank you. So, Jangju, Ningpo, Chi Ki Bar. So, you see, that's three words together Chi Ki Bar, Chi Ki Bar, Chi Ki Bar. There's three hyphens there, or two hyphens, Chi Ki Bar, linking three, three words there. Then the next line is Sange Namla Kyabsu Chi Chodang Changshub Sempa Yi Soklang Deshin Kyabsu Chi. So that uh, Sok uh, Sok La La Yang La Yang Deshin Kyabsu Chi La Yang La Yang. I know a lot of people stumble on that. So Sok La Yang Deshin Kyabsu Chi. So neither. You know, we get tongue-tied with this. It's very easy to do with the Tibetan. But the more that we do it, the more we practice it, um, the, the, the more fluid it becomes, the easier it becomes. Then the next stanza says, Jitar Nongi Deshegi Shangshub Tugni Ke Pa Dang Shangshub Senpe La Pa La Deidag Rimshen Ne Pa Tar Deshen Jola Pen Dan Du Pen Dan Du. It's not a fen, it's Pen Dan Du. Shangju, Semni, Ke Gi Shing. Deshin, Duni, Lab Pa La. Rimpa, Shindu, Lab Pa Ji O. So um, some lamas put an O at the end of the Gi, and um, my root teacher does so i've taken to do that because every time i do it i always think of my root teacher and i don't see him very often but you know it's a way of connecting with him every single day that i do this practice so uh so that's why we do it um i don't know that the o has a significance uh, bernie do you know if, if putting an o at the end of that geo if there's a particular significance to it 
I think it's mostly to make the number of syllables come out right. It uh, really doesn't have any great significance. Uh, it really just signifies the end of a of a statement where you had that O on the end. Okay. So, but it's mostly to make the number of syllables come out right in each line. So, okay. So, does anybody have any questions about the Tibetan then? Okay, so then let's recite this together. So, this is another refuge prayer. So, we did the long refuge prayer. This taking the Bodhisattva vow is a refuge prayer. So, we make sure that we're holding the three jewels at our heart. So we recite in English once, then in the Tibetan. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta, and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Shangju Ning Por Chi Ki Bar Sange Nam La Kab Su Chi Cho Dang Shang Shu Sampa Yi So Klang De Shin Kab Su Chi Jitar Nong Gi De Shegi Shang Shu Tug Ni Ke Pa Dang Shang Shu Sam Pe La Pa La De Dag Rim Shen E Pa Tar De Shen Dro La Pen Dan Du Shang Shu Sam Ni Ki Gi Shing De Shen Du Ni La Pa La Rampa Shindu La Pajio. So that was a little bit of a melody. And one thing I wanted to point out here is when we do these prayers, this is the most solemn of all the prayers. So this prayer usually is done more slowly and more deliberately. And at the end of each line like that, it's got a a, a, an abrupt stop with no carrying on, you know, holding the syllable or anything like that. It's very abrupt, so it's very precise, it's very, it's very direct, it's very meaningful, it's very solemn. It's a it's the uh taking the bodhisattva vow. So it's a it's a great, it's a heartfelt vow vow that we are taking. So I'll just want to finish uh, with the uh, short refuge prayer. I think these next two prayers, the short refuge prayer and the and the um, four measurables, we've been over many times, or or at least you can um, extract the meanings for yourself. We can go over it again next time, but I think we should just recite these. So uh, page five, the short refuge prayer, and the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. So I'll point out that the first two lines in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. That is the refuge. The next two lines, by the merit of generosity and other good deeds, May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. That is compassion. So that's the compassionate part. So we're taking refuge and we're also saying our compassion, which is our bodhicitta, that I will, until enlightenment is reached by the merit of generosity, excuse me, by the merit of generosity and other good deeds, I will attain Buddhahood for the benefit of others. So that's a, an expression of bodhicitta. So bodhicitta and refuge are built into that one prayer. So then we recite it again in English one time and then the Tibetan. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. 
by the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sange cho dang so ki cho nam la. Shang Zhu Bardu Dagni Kapsu Chi Dagi Jin So Ki Pe So Nam Gi Dro La Pen Sange Ju Pa So that's pretty clear, simple. Okay. So I think we'll end now, but um, is this helpful? Should we continue this with the um, next time with the uh, dedication prayers? Going through and going through the meaning and any uh, words that need to be explained or something like that. So uh, we interrupt our dual ornament liberation study uh, to talk about the uh, the prayers like this. Okay. All right, so we need to do our dedication for this. So we'll go and we will go to page 21 in our uh, 101 prayer book. We go to the dedication prayer by Lord Jigden Sumgun. So this is only transcribed for us in the English. So um, we recite this. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas, divine assembly of Yidams, and assemblies of the Buddhas, Daki, uh, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yoginis, and Dakinis dwelling in the ten directions, please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate word of virtue not result in the eight worldly concerns, the four causes of samsara, or rebirth as a Shravaka or Pratyaka Buddha. May all mothers sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading Mars and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings from my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise for even a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. And through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily in the great luminosity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dharmata. May I, in any case, gain the supreme attainment a Mahamudra at the time of death or in the bardo. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones for the benefit of all sentient beings. Thank you very much for your patience. I know that this might have been Thank difficult. Thank you, Lance. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, Lance. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Great to go through everything. I'm sorry. Uh, what were you saying, Alex? It it it, it was great uh, to go through everything in, in in greater detail than I ever heard before. Well, very good. Thank you very much for joining. More questions for next time, maybe. <laughs> very good.